Good morning, traders, and welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader webinar series uh, for December 7th. Uh, today we have Brent Kachuba of Spot Gamma, uh, and uh, he's going to go over options levels uh, with stocks and futures. Uh, and I need to go through the risk disclaimer here. We've kind of updated this, so uh, a general disclosure and risk disclosure. Uh, and then I'll introduce you to uh, to Brent, and then we'll uh, get started here. Uh, the general disclosure. Uh, all bookmap limited materials, information, and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations. Live trading is in simulation, demo, paper trading mode, and strictly for educational purposes. Live trading executed in simulation cannot accurately represent realistic trading performance. Risk disclosure, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. An investor could potentially lose all or more than the initial investment. Risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security nor lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading and only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You can read the hypothetical performance here if you like. Um, and um, a little uh, bit about Brent. We've had him now, I don't know, is this the third time or fourth time? Something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah and uh, 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 expert trader here, uh, a, a complete expert in, uh, in um, uh, uh, options uh, for almost 20 years. He has institutional background with Bank of America and uh, Credit Suisse uh, and equities broker as well, and also from the algorithmic sales and trading uh, as well. Um, he also worked at um, uh, Wolverine, uh, representing the electronic uh, derivatives trading platform. Uh, and now currently Brent is trading uh, some proprietary strategies and runs spotgamma.com, which publishes publishes various metrics on options data. Uh, and uh, here is all of Brent or Spot Gamma's um, contact information here. I am going to paste this into the chart for you guys. Uh, these are special offers also from Brent. Uh, one more thing I need to mention to you guys uh, here is um, that um, uh, there is, uh, I'm kind of uh, giving you a little bit of insight before uh, we release this. Um, there's a code, I'm gonna put it into the chat for you and I'll mention it again. Uh, for those of you who are new in here, uh, new to Bookmap, uh, for the first month, uh, you can get 50% off. All right, so uh, it's all for you know people new to Bookmap. Uh, if you want to give it a try, uh, so I'll, I'm going to put a special coupon code into the uh, chat there for you, uh, and um, uh, you can uh, uh, input that in when you purchase, and you'll get the 50% off just for this first month. Okay, all right, guys, uh, we we're going to offer it next week as well, um, that 50% off. But it's with this Pro Trader webinar, the idea was that if you guys are uh, new to Bookmap and you want to get started immediately, well, we're going to give you the coupon right now so you can get started. You don't have to wait for the sale uh, next week. Okay, it's going to be, you know, the, the Christmas special, you know, blah, blah. Um, all right, so uh, let's see here. Um, let's just get started. I see some questions already, but uh, we'll just get started here. And uh, Brent, I'm going to pass you the presentation. Great. Uh, let's see here. I just want to make sure I have my right screen set up. All right. Can you see that? Uh, all right, Bruce? No. All right. I think there's a, um, there you How's go. That? Yeah. Okay. One day I'll get better at this stuff. I can say that every time. <laughs> Uh, so thank you all for taking it's, the time. It's, this it's actually, uh, I, I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm seeing it vertically. Um, I, I think you have one of your monitors. Vertically. Yeah. Better. It's still so quite vertical. small. It's, it's like on a vertical monitor. It looks like. That doesn't seem right. Huh? This is what everybody wants to see me do right now is monkey around with. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> do you, right. um, let's see here. I do have a vertical screen, but I'm not showing on that one. So that's a little bit strange here. All right, let's see. There you How's go. That? All right. So yeah, I see that. I, yeah. All right, there, there we go. go. 
Looks great. Looks great. Much more professional now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all uh, for showing up today. Um, I want to talk about two things. One, I, I talk often about you know futures and the um, ES futures. I want to touch on stocks. Uh, so I'm going to do kind of a combination thing, but they're all going to be um, kind of tied together here. Um, so one of the things that many of you are probably familiar with are the record levels of call options that we've been seeing in the marketplace. And um, what's so interesting about that is that the options market, you know, this is kind of a story we've been talking about for a while, but it continues to become a larger and larger piece of the market uh, and piece of underlying liquidity. So if you see this chart here uh, from Goldman, you can see that based on the amount of hedging that the options require, um, the no daily notional traded, if you look at how big on a notional value the options market is compared to equities, it's become sort of the tail wagging the dog. And what I mean by that is you can look at a lot of the top, uh, not just in ES, but also in single stocks and see how the options complex is really driving, you know, the, the underlying liquidity. And I bring that up for two reasons. One, you need to really pay attention to, um, you know, where options are, are showing up and trading um, in your single stock names if you're trading single stocks. But two, um, you can't just look at ES if you're an ES trader. You can't just look at that in a silo. And what I mean by that is you can't just look at ES and ES liquidity and ignore all that's going on in spiders and, um, and some of these other kind of derivatives of the S&P as well. Um, so it's a it, it's all linked together, right? So if you if you consider this, and and many of you are, are many of you are probably familiar with this idea or, or how this works, um, but the S and P index is really what drives the price of the S and P, right? So they they take all the individual stocks on the open and uh, all the individual stocks that are used to uh, that are indexed to the S and P 500, and the value, the sum of where those are trading is what the value of the SPX index is. So, you know, those underlying stocks are the driver of the value of the S&P, right? But ultimately, there's people that arbitrage the price of spiders and ES and all these individual, you know, like VOO, which is the Vanguard S&P, all of those are arbitraged together, right? To, so that they all kind of link. And what's interesting about this is that you would assume that sort of the feedback loop goes you know that the ES and the individual stocks kind of control things, but what you're going to see when I show you in a, in a slide in a minute is I think what's happening now is you're getting spiders, is what's kind of dominating the options complex, and I think that is having a major feedback me mechanism back into the ES. And so hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll be able to sort of show how that works. For those of you who are familiar with my levels, this is what the combo strikes are, where, we're, where we really pay a little bit more attention or, or weight the spiders more than the SPX. Um, and so, again, it's very important, and, and this works for the NASDAQ as well. The NASDAQ futures complex is not, uh, excuse me, the NASDAQ options complex, the NQ index is not very big. It's the Qs that is the big driver of that complex. And that's been that way for quite some time. Same thing with Russell, the IWM is much bigger than uh, the RUT index options. SPX, the big contracts in options has been the driver historically, but that's really kind of switched recently and it's, it's quite an interesting time. Um, so just to give you one quick metric, you know, we showed you that Goldman slide. This is hot off the press, so to speak. This is the amount of buying to open premium uh, in calls and puts for broken down by different sectors, right? Or, or different uh, categories. So this is equity call premiums. This is how much people are spending to buy calls. Um, and then you can see how much they're willing to buy or spend on puts. It's way down here. And what is relevant sort of to this conversation is note index options. They're actually down 2% from a, from a volume perspective, uh, while obviously equity premiums are massively. So the index complex is not participating in this rapid rise of options trading and options volumes. Uh, I'd also note that futures volumes are off as well. Um, so what we're seeing is equity, people are piling into equities and that means that spiders and the ETFs, which are seeing you know, this, this drive, you know, the drive is not the same as individual stocks, but it is the same in spiders. Spiders for some reason has escaped sort of this equity call premium um, uh, the drop in equity call premiums. I think if you look at like XLF, you know, XLE, those those types of ETFs, those are, are off quite a bit. Um, so let's just give a brief comparison of those three 
areas, right? So when we look at gamma, I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with our our, our conversations on gamma, and, and we've done some primers and things like that here with with Bookmap. You can watch those videos if you want to sort of dig into exactly what we're talking about with gamma. But essentially, what we're doing by measuring gamma is we're measuring the size of the options market. Uh, gamma is highest for options that are at the money, and gamma also increases the closer to expiration you get. So really, what gamma is simply telling you is the, it, it's weighting the size of the options market, but it's also weighting calls versus puts, right? So if you consider a positive gamma number, that's telling you there's a lot more calls than there are puts in the marketplace. And the more negative or the more towards zero this number gets, and the, as it goes negative, that's simply telling you that the market has more puts, the S&P has more puts than calls, right? In terms of where that gamma weighting is. So if you look at the size of spiders, and this is as of Friday, you, know, you have $2 billion in spider gamma and you only have 600 million SPX gamma. The levels sync up, as you can see here, you see 370 is our call wall or, or sort of where the most positive gamma is, is laid out. And that matches with SPX, which is 3,700. So the two are in sync more or less, right? But the size of spiders is way bigger than, than SPX. And so this matters when you're sort of laying out the options level and where liquidity for futures may show up because I believe market makers still use futures to hedge the S&Ps. But where spiders are trading right now may have a little bit more of an impact in ES than where sort of the bulk of S&P open interest is. And I'll, and I'll show that in a live shot in a second. Many of you are probably gonna ask about ES options. I, I used to look at the size of the ES options complex and I, I stopped bothering, you know, about six months ago. Um, if you just consider the volume from Friday, you can see that we traded about 200,000 contracts in the ES options. SPX and SPY traded over a million. Um, Spiders obviously traded about, uh, you know, a lot more than a million. And then if you just consider the open interest um, for SPX in December alone, which is a humongous expiration, that could be a real day on your counter to mark obviously not just with the Tesla inclusion and the quarterly rebalance, but there's a lot of open interest expiring and we think that can mark a turning point. So for those of you who um, uh, want to mark sort of very important dates, 12-16, which is the big VIX expiration, and the 12-18 is a big uh, quad witching expiration. Those could be key turning points in the market. Uh, but aside from that, note that the open interest in December just in SPX is almost 2 million calls and 3.5 million puts. Look at the open interest in the uh, in the for the entirety of the s p uh, e-mini options it's only 1.8 million and that goes across all expirations so you just see the es options complex is, is quite a bit smaller um so i wanted to show quickly here our our screen um and what you can see here is what we show is one this is sort of what we call the call wall right and what the call wall is is where the most positive gamut is trading in the uh spx and then we have this idea of the combo strike. So what this combo strike is actually showing you is it's actually showing you a combination of spider options and SPX options. And what we do is we kind of blend that open interest together and back out what the relevant prices are. Um, and so what you can see, and if you've been sort of tracking our work, that call wall has been at this level and it's also 370 in spiders for quite some time, meaning um, basically all of last week. And what we think, how this, we think this works is when you have a whole bunch of options uh, tied to a certain strike, right? Tied to a certain level in the S&P, you get all sorts of options forces that serve to sort of draw the market up into that strike. And that's a combination of the way that dealers are hedging and the way that other people, other entities are hedging um, and essentially time decay in the market, right? Uh, if you if you consider that these are all long calls or dealers are are, are long those calls as the expiration moves to the Friday expiration, uh, as we march forward in time, those calls are decaying. And as those calls are decaying, dealers who are short, short futures versus long calls will have to start buying stock back, right? They'll have to start buying futures back. And that has a natural sort of way of sort of levitating or bringing us into sort of, you know, pinning this large interest area. And then what happens as you kind of get especially close to these big round numbers, which people like, you know, that will also draw more hedging and more flows to these specific levels. And so what you end up getting is this idea of it being a resistance point, but it's also kind of a pinpoint, right? It kind of draws people, draws the market in and holds it there. And you'll see the liquidity form in these kind of big areas. So what's interesting about this 
3689 is if you look at where spiders are trading, um, you can see that the round number in spiders will be significant support or resistance levels in the ES. So, you know, there's an arbitrage, there's a difference obviously between 3700 in the ES compared to where 370 is trading in spiders, right? And so what you may want to note is, you know, where's 370 in spiders and where does that correlate or correspond to the, you know, what's the equivalent ES price, right? And, and, um, and does the market react to that because of the amount of open interest in spiders and how that needs to be hedged? That may be sort of wagging the SPX dog, if that makes sense. Um, and so really what you want to do, I think if you are an ES trader is you want to pay attention. This goes for Qs and NASDAQ, as we sort of said before, you need to be aware of how big the options complex is in those ETFs and maybe weight those a little bit differently um, when you're sort of forecasting or setting up, you know, the different trade levels for, for your day trading plan. Um, and if you kind of zoom back here, I think the, I forget what the number one combo strike level is, but, you know, kind of as you pull back, what you'll see is there are odd strikes that we mark with these combo levels, right? 3715 is not a very big strike in SPX, but what that's dominated by is the size of the open interest in the spiders. And so these different levels you'll see play out and will be significant um, as sort of the market moves and shifts around, right? And again, as we kind of pin this high open interest area, what you're gonna see is liquidity, as shown in book map here, you'll see liquidity sort of form in this area. You'll see things kind of pin. And then as we get closer to that 12, 18 expiration, as the open interest sort of starts to unwind or wear off as it decays, you'll see kind of the market ranges expand and, and you should see things shift around, right? Um, but the important thing I guess I'm trying to convey here is that it's the it's the ETFs right now that are really kind of controlling um, the way that we're viewing the market and not necessarily the uh, the index. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop there for a second and see if anyone has any questions as I'm going to shift a little bit to single stocks, which sort of rhymes what we're talking about here. Um, but are there any questions specifically on that spider SPX relation and, and how that may feed back into the, uh, um, yes, nothing, uh, yet, okay. uh, but let me, let me, let me see here. There's, um, a few different questions already. Um, well, first off, uh, David, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, David's been really active uh, uh, tweeting, uh, David Blake here, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, loves your levels and just, uh, uh, you know, thinks uh, you're basically a unicorn here. Um, <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Steve is asking, do your levels work better on the ES compared to the NQ? Yeah, I think the, um, the the size of the options complex in the SPX is bigger than the NQ just because, you know, SPX is still pretty big. It, you know, even though spiders are so much bigger, SPX still holds a lot of size. Um, and so when you look at the combined amount of notional value in the SPX plus the spiders, it just heavily outweighs that of the NASDAQ. The other issue is that if you look at the components of the S&P, there's a lot more obviously hot tech names and momentum names in the queues. And so I think the queues can also be pushed a little bit more by what's happening in the single stock, underlying single stock names. Um, so I think single stocks weighs more on or pushes the queues more than the, uh, than the ES. So um, the biggest levels in the, in the NASDAQ matter a lot, um, whereas I think you can you can zoom in a little bit more and look at some of our smaller levels in the S&P that are a little more accurate. Uh, whereas the NASDAQ, I would just pay attention to maybe the top two or three levels as opposed to the S&P where you can look at sort of five different levels. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Jeff is asking, which I don't quite understand, uh, uh, Jeff, um, uh, how uh, you configure your lift bid and ask. Oh, um, this, he may be talking about Walter's, uh, ah, okay. uh, window here below, um, trade, this is, uh, from our friend Walter, uh, who works a lot with Bookmap. He offers this, uh, uh, this liquidity indicator here below. So, uh, trade to win is his, is his site. Okay. Um, you know, actually I, I, um, let's see, here's another, are dealers typically net short or net long on the call wall? Yeah, so um, it, I think it really moves into a blend. So we typically would view 
the call wall as dealers being short futures. So they're long, they're long calls at that call wall, right? But I think as you kind of get closer, what ends up happening is a, a different mix of volumes come in. And what I be, but what I mean by that is that if you were to look at the volume and options on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there's an expiration each on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so what happens is you get a ton of day traders that come in on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and they add a ton of volume in. And that daily volume um, that doesn't show up on our gamma charts because it you know comes in on Monday at the open and it close you know it expires at the close. So what you end up getting is the uh, you, know, you know a mix of different traders doing different things. And and so you know their but their their view on the market is a day out, right? They're they're going to sell a straddle or a strangle around 3,700. They're trying to bring income. You know they're taking a big swing. So it's a mix of volumes and you kind of bring up an interesting point here because that intraday volume can matter a lot. If you see a lot of times into the close, there'll be really big moves, right? In the last five minutes of the day, you'll have a five, 10, 15 handle move. A lot of times I think that can be because the dealers need to adjust their book into that 4 p.m. close because they need to hedge out or adjust hedges uh, or something, you know, arguably more nefarious kind of around that, that volume, right? Um, so in other words, if if on the on the let's take today for example, if there's a ton of volume going off at 3,700 today, we may see a huge spike up in the market into the close because, you know, 3,700 there's a lot of cash premium tied to uh, t those options are all tied to the four o'clock close, right? So there's a lot of premiums um, that are going to settle based on where the market's going to close. So maybe we shift up really quickly at 30, into 3,700 at the close because today's options volume is so big, right? And then tomorrow we'll kind of pull that pin because there's no expiration tomorrow. Uh, hopefully I explain that you know, in a way that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I would probably like derail this whole webinar. I'm just fascinated by what you just presented about the SPY and, and, and compared to the ES um, and SPX. Uh, very odd and strange. Um, I, it, I mean, this is a major, like a major shift, like a kind of revolutionary, it looks like to me. But, um, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to any any comment on that just uh, to begin with like yeah uh, yeah I think you know um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a small point um, and and hopefully it was sort of made clear in sort of just a very short you know few slides to talk about it um, but I think it's a it, you know it's very strange I, you know of all the exchange if you look at all the individual exchanges I'm not sure how many are you familiar with with how that works but there's I think there's, I don't know, there's 15 now options exchanges, but the SPX is listed only on the SIBO exchange. The SIBO uh, is the only exchange that has lower volume this year than than any of the other listed exchanges. And that's because the SPX index was forever kind of their their honeypot, so to speak. And and that has, uh, you know, the volumes there have dropped um, or really stayed flat at, you know, kind of at best. Uh, whereas Spider has obviously done, you know, quite a bit more volume, and and then you have VOO and some of these other, you know, other S and P linked products that are popping up, uh, and so that's it's really fascinating, and and that is a derivative or or whatever happened is a result of the you know the COVID crash in March. Um, th things before the COVID crash were not like that. There, you know, entities I think were blown up. Um, during the COVID crash, meaning a lot of volatility, you know, trading entities. Um, and, and I think that's really what the ramifications have been. And then, you know, people, retail and the like have been using spiders as a way to express their long S&P views. Um, and so it's really pretty amazing shift. I've been, I've been waiting for it to shift back, but, but if anything, the kind of the, the chasm has, has widened there um, in that respect. Uh, and then when you look at the fact that, the, you know, the futures, uh, is off as well you know it just sort of highlights the importance of of knowing where spiders are and i think that may be a different um a different way of looking at it maybe than than a lot of futures traders have been you know in the in the past hmm. uh, very very weird um uh jason's asking here about um uh, is there a way that one can see gamma um uh becoming more positive or negative uh, and what amounts um yeah so you know really again it's kind of a it's a it's a function of where you know 
how many calls are trading, you know, relative to puts. And so, you know, I think you can kind of extrapolate what's going to happen uh, in the future just based off of recent trend. You know, it's it's unlikely that when we have record call volumes in the market doing so well that we're going to suddenly, you know, flip to calls without a catalyst. And that's why I think the expirations are so important because if you consider, you know, this, the upcoming expiration that's going to occur on 12, 18, um, dealers who are, you know, if you just consider all options, you know, that are all listed options, you know, just consider this chart. This is telling you that people are long tons of call options. 12, 18 expiration is the most concentrated expiration. What I mean by that is most options have very large gamma levels expiring on 12, 18. So if you think about what that means, dealers who are short calls on net, right, in single stocks. So if you add up Tesla and Qs and, you know, the whole, all the listed options, dealers are long stock versus those short calls, right? Because because if, if everyone and their brother's buying calls, dealers are short those calls, the way they hedge is to buy stock. So on 12, 18, all those options expire, right? They're all gone. Well, dealers still have all their long hedges, right? What do they have to do with that? Well, they have to unwind those hedges. So that's why those expirations can be such important inflection points because what can happen in this situation when everyone's long calls, if you suddenly unwind, you know, the dealers unwind their long hedges, that could put selling pressure on the market. And in, in this market just seems set up that no one is hedging downside. So what can happen then is suddenly, you know, it's a, it's a scramble, right, to, to, catch, to catch downside or, or, to, or to hedge your downside risk. A great example of that is what happened into August, you know, on uh, the, the, the high in August was around those Tesla and Apple splits. Everyone bought calls because, you know, hey, free money, stock splitting, you know, look at us. And that's what this peak is right here, right? And you can, this peak was right before the 10% drawdown, you know, that came with that August sort of call ramp unwind. And so, you know, this is the same situation, right? This is the exact same thing. And what's so interesting is I, I can't shake the feeling that Tesla is going to have something to do with, you know, this addition to the S&P is going to have something to do with, you know, an inflection point in the market. Um, you can never be sure, but, you know, just can't, can't quite shake that, uh, that feeling. Um, so that's again on 12, 18, which is about 10 days. So who knows, this could ramp up again to, to retest the August highs. Um, and then what's the catalyst to kind of get people selling and to get people worried and get people hedging, you know, hedging the downside. Well, it could be this expiration in which again, dealers are kind of needing to unwind that they're, they're big, uh, long hedge position. Okay, excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it for now. Okay, so um, so let's talk about a couple single stocks just to just to touch on this. Um, so I'm going to talk about Tesla because it's it's such an interesting um, stock to watch, obviously right now. And so for those of you who are not terribly familiar with the mechanics of of how the S and P will uh, add on 1218 and i know a lot of you don't follow this but again because it's going to be uh quite possibly one of the top largest stocks in the s p index it could have a quite an impact on the way the s p x the spx we calculate and the way it's going to move uh, and consequently that's going to have that feedback loop back into es right and so on 1218 at the close of 1218 anyone that indexes to the s p 500 so those are i think it's about five trillion dollars of assets indexes to the s p 500 uh, so you have pension funds, you know, all sorts of large asset managers that own the underlying individual stocks that comprise of the S&P as they track the index itself. So they're all going to need to own Tesla at the close of trading on 1218. And the way that they do that is banks, you know, Bank of America and Credit Suisse and the like will actually buy Tesla uh, going into the close of Friday. And then on the close, they essentially put in what's called a market on close order and they flip the stock to those big pension funds uh, on the close of trading at 1218. And they do that because the index is calculated based on the closing levels of the S&P on Friday night. So all the indexers want to own that, uh, own Tesla at, at the closing price of Friday night, 1218, or a little bit better. That way they show that they're tracking the S&P accurately. Um, and so the banks will go out ahead of time to all these different pension funds and, and they'll try to get a deal with them, right? Bruce is going to index the S&P. He said, Bruce, I will guarantee you the close of trading on 1218. You know, how much notionally are you going to agree to give me? And Bruce will say, okay, you know, I'm, I need to buy a billion dollars notional Tesla. And I'll say, great. 
Um, and so I know as a dealer, I need to buy a billion dollars notional of Tesla to sell to Bruce at the close of trading on, on 12, 18. Um, and so that's why that's kind of an important date. And that's why the stock has been sort of driving as a lot of people are obviously trying to front run that trade or get in front of that index ad as, as everyone knows. Um, and so if you look at the way that options have been trading around this, it's kind of interesting because you can see as we kind of pop back into the slides here, you can see that the S&P news was added on uh, November 17th or 18th. And the stock obviously had a pretty big bounce, but what it did is it generated massive amounts of call buying for reasons you can understand. And so what we've been tracking is that wherever that largest call position goes is where the stock will rise up and then will pin. So what happens is, and this is a phenomenon that works in the S&P and any other single stock. So Tesla's just an example because, you know, it's, it's <clears throat> such an active name, but the weekly options, so every Friday is where there's a bunch of options expiring, um, will be the where the largest volume goes in terms of the call. So basically what I'm saying is today is Monday and most people will start buying calls that expire for Friday in Tesla. And that's essentially what you're seeing here. Everyone piled into uh, options that expired you know, on this Friday, which is the 20th, uh, which is somewhere in here. And it was 500 strike options. The stock went up to that and pinned that level exactly. Why? Because as we get closer to Friday, all the 500 strike calls start to decay, right? So initially when people go buy calls, dealers have to buy stock to hedge themselves. But then as that call buying subsides a little bit and as those calls start to decay, right? Anything at 500 or over starts to decay and the stock kind of pins that level. Then what happens? Monday, they, they reload. Well, where did they reload? They reloaded to 600. So we marched right to 600 and we kind of pinned that area all week. And now what's happening in the stock? Well, it's up, I think, as we saw before, good 20 or 30 bucks so far today. And why is that? Well, Friday's data said that 600 was the large strike, call strike area, but now it's shifting up to 700, I believe. So if you kind of just look at where the Tesla volume is so far at the moment, as I bring up my broker system here, so far today, we've traded almost 300,000 calls in Tesla and only 100,000 puts. So this is all call buying driven, you know, hedging volume you know to, uh for tesla to trade a million calls that's a lot and you can you can sort of watch as those calls tick up this volume is just hedging volume right and they'll and they'll keep kind of sweeping this thing up and they'll keep going and you can and you can watch this happen in all sorts of different stocks what's fascinating is typically what will happen on friday night in a lot of these heavy call names like pltr is a great example of this on monday you'll see a big unwind and this is sort of tied to what I was talking before about the December uh, 18th expiration is that dealers who are along a bunch of stock will need to sell that stock, right? They'll, they'll need to unwind that stock. The caveat to that is, of course, if big call buyers step right in uh, immediately on Monday and start buying that stock. So ACB was one that was a huge call buying last week. And you could see this the drop in this name, right? This is a huge sell off in this name because it had a massive amount of calls that expired on Friday. So dealers unwind, and then here we go. And I, I haven't checked ACB volume, but I'd be willing to bet that you know call buyers are now stepping in and kind of buying this dip. That puts the floor on the stock and adds sort of pressure as the stock shifts higher. Um, and so you can look at you know these different positions. So if you were to look at this is our equity hub tool. If you go to Spot Gamma, you can check this out. Um, this is what Tesla looks like, right? This is the options complex. And so what you're seeing here is this blue line is a representation of call buying. Uh, this is accurate as of Friday's close. The orange line is how much puts are in the market in terms of put game. And so when you get a big divergence like this, this is telling you that people are flooding into calls as, as obvious in Tesla, right? But some of the other stocks may not be as obvious. And so what we're talking about, the key gamma level being 600, you'll note that the top call interest is 700. So what happens is as call buyers step in now, where all the major gamma is, right? Where the dealers want to hedge will shift from 600 to 700. And as that shift happens, that's where you get sort of this difference here in the way that the stock moves. And you can see this against all sorts of different stocks. Again, you know, you want to look at stocks where obviously open interest is the biggest, um, but this phenomenon is something that works the same in Tesla as it has in SPX with our call walls. You know, we were at 360 a couple of weeks ago that that level shifted to 370 or 3700. Now we hit 3700 and the, the call wall is now threatening an S&P to move to 3750. 
Um, and it's, it's the same phenomenon in, any, in, in everything, right? Um, and it's really just this idea that call additions, you know, force the market kind of higher. Um, and that's a mechanism that seems to repeat until we get expirations and things sort of shift or, or adjust. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. So you want to have any, any questions on that? Uh, let's see here. Um, no, I don't think so. No, nothing yet. Um, this is okay. just fascinating stuff though, Brent. I mean, it just seems like, uh, um, just uh, this kind of knowledge as well is just, just jump in and, and let it ride. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, I think it's a very hard thing to do and you can, and you can, you know, obviously if, if, if news in the S and P or so, so really what all this boils down to is volume, right? And when you have a lot of options, that means there's a lot more underlying volume tied to those options. Um, and so, you know, obviously if, if, if it comes out this afternoon that, you know, Tesla has been cooking their books or whatever, I mean, Tesla is different. The stock will probably still go up, but, you know, catastrophic news is not going to, you know, the options market can't account for that kind of major news or major volume, right? Just like in S&P, we, we forecast a very tight trading market, a small range today because there's so much options. But obviously, if you get very bad news, you know, it's going to overwhelm, you know, the amount of options hedging. So you kind of have to weigh some of that, particularly names where there's a not a huge options complex, but just decent size. Um, and some of those names can be, you know, the moves will be a little bit sh more shorter, short term. Um, so, but, you know, on net, you can go in and you can look at the size of the options complex. So if you come into like this, this tour, if you look at what the top trading names are on uh, Twitter, a lot of, you know, different um, uh People will tweet out the big options trading names. You know, like I was looking at, uh, you know, Pfizer is obviously a popular one today. There's a, there's a lot of options, uh, you know, that trade here. This is a pretty big complex. You get 363,000 options trade a day. But if you switch to a name, you know, like Yum or something like that, you know, 30,000 open interest, you know, it's just nothing trades in this name, right? So options aren't going to have any impact here on what's going on. Um, you know, but but Tesla and Apple and all these other names have just massive amounts of of you know, volume. And I think this is where the options complex really, you know, in a way dictates what's going on in the, uh, in the underlying stocks. I'm going to look at a few of them. I loaded a few up. I, I haven't looked at any of these stocks yet today. So I just like to see what's going on put myself on the spot a little bit. So, you know, Pfizer, uh, which is obviously big vaccine news has a ton of open interest at, at 40. Um, so again, we measure gamma and, and Delta and what gamma is telling you, we get this question a lot, Game is telling you where the options are most concentrated, uh, which is obviously the 40, 40 strike. And what's interesting about Delta is Delta is telling you where the most in the money options are. And that matters into expiration because if you think about where there's a lot of in the money options expiring, those require the biggest hedges. So if those in the money options expire, then you could get, you know, bigger Delta, uh, a big Delta, meaning big, big hedge unwind in these names. So, you know, 40 is the big strike in, uh, in Pfizer, the big, uh, there's calls up at 45, so this stock has good support at 40, and you know should get a pretty good boost up to 45. And I have no idea what Pfizer's doing, but we'll see what happens. So it looks like it's kind of holding 40 here, um, and there's a pretty decent amount of liquidity. You know, it's posted up, you know, right above that level. So you know, in my eyes and my view, you know, the fact that this is bouncing like that is indicative of the fact that there's so much, you know, options going on or options holding that. Uh, that 40 strike level. Um, you know, you can look at probably a bunch of these other names and it'll be a very, you know, similar phenomenon. Um, Kodak had a bunch of news today. I mean, this is just an amazing move, isn't it? Four, $14 down to 11 in one day. Um, so, you know, hopefully I was able to kind of convey the idea and the sentiment here of what's, what's happening in this name. Looks like 10 is kind of the key level that we see in Kodak and it hasn't quite made there. So, um, see how that kind of unfolds but is there any anyone have questions there on on the single stock side or just any more of these options expiration and flows that i can that i can answer uh no no questions at the moment right. looks Most like you have some some people that uh, are taking you up and uh, on your trial uh great so uh, yeah <laughs> great all right i'll take that well if there's no questions it must have been because it was a an amazingly succinct presentation that's right. Clear as a bell. <laughs>
Yeah, and so um, so I'll talk for one more minute about just sort of what our forecast is for the for the market here. Um, what we view this call wall as a as our major resistance point. So our view uh, is that unless this call wall shifts higher, the market is 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 capped here. Um, and so if we do get a move above, we would expect mean reversion back below this level, and the market will sort of hold this as a significant area up until this call wall level rolls higher. If it doesn't roll higher, then we don't think the market is really going to move up or shift up. Um, and so that's kind of our view for right now. Um, 3750 is is a strike that, depending on how today's flows are in options, that maybe this call wall does shift up to 3750 in the next day or two. But for the moment, you know, we think that this caps the market. Uh, and to the downside, because there is so much positive gamma, um, what that infers is that we shouldn't have a whole lot of movement uh, in the market. So when you have a total notional S&P of 2 billion positive gamma, what that's telling you is there's a lot of dealer buying as the market goes down and a lot of dealer selling as the market goes up. And that has an effect of, of constricting or, or capping volatility, right? Um, and so we think that really the last three or four days, we've had a pretty tight trading range. And because there's so much positive gamma, that should hold. And because there is so much options tied to the 12, 18 expiration, and we may kind of just have a rather dull market in the S&P up until you know next week uh, when the VIX expires and, and um, that that shakes things up a little bit. Um, it's the other interesting thing to note is that you know the VIX is trading at uh, I haven't seen it since we started the presentation, but it was up around 21 or 22. And if you do the dirty math on that, that that's something like a one you know, that forecast is over a one percent move in the S&P, um, which is obviously not really what we've been getting recently. So. It's interesting that the, the VIX remains so high, and I think a lot of that is related to this 12-16 VIX expiration when there's a lot of 20 strike puts uh, that are set to expire, and so that could be kind of an unpinning of the of the volatility complex, and who knows how that manifests. That could just mean that, you know, suddenly that VIX 20, floor, floor, 20 strike floor is broken. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see, but, I, but I'm pretty sure things will get, you know, shaken up, so to speak, into that, uh, into that expiration. Yeah, I mean, and it just sounds like a, there's even potential for like, a, I mean, just massive volatility at that time uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, year end is always obviously, you know, a pretty, you know, it, it tends to be very bullish and, and uh, you know, who's to say that's not the case again this time. Um, clearly, sentiment is heavily tilted towards puts, uh, excuse me, towards calls. Uh, the, the, the composite put call ratio made a 2020 low um, last week. So, you know, there's no one wants to own downside protection. If you look at short interest, it's the same thing. You know, short interest is uh, anemic at best. And so it's a very kind of one sided, you know, trade and boat. Um, obviously, the S&P inclusion of Tesla is, is on net a delta neutral trade, meaning that, you know, they need to sell uh, indexers need to sell a certain amount of stock in order to buy Tesla, right? So on net, that's a delta neutral trade because they're selling other stocks in the equivalent notional amount to what they need to buy in Tesla. Um, you know, but that, so that shouldn't technically have an impact on where the S&P is trading. Um, but these big events, you know, tend to sort of be a catalyst or an unwind. For instance, will people still want to buy calls after Tesla's been added? You know, will you still want to buy a Tesla call after it's been added to the S&P? sort of what's your new thesis there of wanting to get long that stock. And that stock drives a ton of call open interest and call volume. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. Um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be uh, a lot of dynamics in the, into the year end. Yeah. It, I mean, it, is this going to be kind of, I mean, I haven't looked at it. Um, uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm just asking uh, if, if when Tesla is added to the S&P 500, uh, are, are we looking at this being like kind of like the IBM of the Dow, like it's the majority, like uh, the market cap of, of the Dow uh, index or um, I, I just can't imagine. I mean, we have 500 stocks in there. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, it grew, you know, it, every day, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the market cap change in Tesla is for today alone, but, you know, that stock's up uh, 5% right now. And so, you know, it, it's it's a massive amount of stock that all these indexers are going to buy. And um, and what's so interesting about it is that the stock is undoubtedly being inflated by call volumes. Um, and so, 
you know, it's 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 completely artificial. And so, you know, it's kind of <laughs> what's strange about that is I think that call buying is going to go away on twelve eighteen, right? And then you have the biggest component of the S and P suddenly just lost all of its, you know sort of momentum i would say right all those call like call volumes have to subside after that ad uh i guess they don't have to but you know I, I would bet that they would and so you're kind of getting this big pump right you're gonna pump in the bubble up and then you're passing the bubble off to the s p indexers which are the pension funds and 401ks and you know people buying spiders and then that biggest component's just gonna deflate and that's just i think it's gonna be a drag on the s p uh at least in the short term but you know um it's just a guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, David again is uh, uh, complimenting you here on the on your pre market notes. Uh, it's been excellent for him uh, setting up his uh, uh, trading plan for the day. Thanks, David. Appreciate that very much. Um, okay. So right. uh, yeah, no no other questions here uh, at the moment. Cool. Um, all right. Well, um, you know, I think if anyone does have questions, you can you can reach out to me on email, uh, sg at spotgamma.com. Um, all of our different plans come with a free five-day trial. Um, so you have five days to, you get full access for five days. Um, and if you want to have the bookmap links, which are the CloudNote links here, you need to subscribe for either the our advanced plan or our full plan, either one of those gets you access to these cloud notes links. These are updated automatically each day, so you don't need to type our individual levels in every day. You just turn on your book map system and, and we're we're pushing the feed out to you automatically. So it's a it's a really nice feature. And you know, I think it's pretty fascinating to watch how the liquidity lines up at these at these different levels. Um, it's been a, a fascinating exercise to watch. Um, and Bruce, I know you have a new um, absorption metric, which which looks like it's showing some interesting synchronicities here between the big options levels. I know the iceberg tracker shows um, some really interesting, um, again, synchronicities between when there's big iceberg or big stop orders in these in these levels um, as well. So I'm, uh, I'm very interested to check that out. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to spend some time with you and and, and go through some of that. Um, yeah, it's, it has been rather um, rather fascinating uh, to see these uh, uh, levels all kind of um, coinciding uh, together, uh, especially at some of these you know uh, higher time frame options uh, areas as well. Um, so yeah, some some uh, some interesting stuff to take a look at for sure. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I've put. Um, uh, Brent's uh, Spot Gamma information here into the chat a few times uh, for you guys. So look into the chat there. Uh, and um, yeah, actually, let me grab the uh, presentation here and I can show you. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you're interested uh, in reaching out uh, to Brent and, uh, you know, his website's in there, his, his email, his Twitter, uh, and then also that 50% uh, code um discount that uh, i was talking about uh, i also put in there so um, you guys have access to that okay so here we go uh, here's brent's uh, information here and let me put that code back in just a moment here sorry okay so just a, a little bit of in, insight on this um so uh next week we will and i'm letting you guys know now uh, we will have a special on Bookmap. It's only for first-time users for the first month only. Uh, it's 50% off. So if you're interested in trying Bookmap out, uh, the reason that I'm giving you the discount code now and I'm kind of preempting that sale is maybe you're going over something interesting in these webinars uh, and you want to try Bookmap right now. You've got it. You've got the code. You can get the discount now. Okay, so that's uh, why we're kind of uh, doing that. Uh, so that you guys uh, uh, can get access uh, immediately and uh, and get a discount as well. Um, yeah, uh, I think that that's it. If there's anything else that you want to go over, Brent, then um, I mean, just I mean, utterly fascinating stuff. I every time that you present, I mean, it's just it's amazing. Like uh, these, um, all the different things that revolve around these options and and. Um, you know the insights that you you gather here and and put, put, putting this and plugging this into uh what's happening in the price action yeah thank you thank you and and i you know we're trying to uh cobble the system together to be able to offer the the trading levels on on bookmap too for individual stocks 
uh, obviously there's 3,500 different stocks, so it's a, a pretty heavy lift, um, you know, to do, but, you know, it's something we definitely are, are trying to get to. Yeah, and, and you can also see like, you know, I mean, what Brent is looking at there uh, in Bookmap is he's looking at the liquidity levels and the order flow around his options levels. That's what he's interested in. Uh, so Right, uh, and, and I think kind of the, the key takeaway too is is if you can figure out, you know, how people are positioned, then, then that is what the advantage is, right? If you know, like in Tesla, you know most people are buying calls, so that, that's giving you a directional edge, I believe. Um, and so, you know, that, that's really what the takeaway I think as a trader is if you know, people are buying puts, if you know, people are buying calls, you can, you can, you know, weight your trades accordingly in those instances. Um, or if you believe that, you know, 3,700 is going to be a pin, you, you know, you can trade differently around, uh, where those options are positioned based on how you think people are positioned. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. I mean, so there, there is your strategy right there. Yeah, and I, and I think you over, you can overlay it on really any strategy. You know, if you're a swing trader or a scalper or whatever it is that you might be, um, you know, kind of knowing that and forecasting how a dealer or how the market may react based on those options flows, you know, I think you can really add a, a, an edge or a, a component to really any strategy. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. One more question it looks like. Um... Uh, we are led to believe that 99% of the options traders are wrong. Um, so I think, I think we... what Kendall's getting at is that 99% or, or it's a massive number of options expire worthless. Um, and so whether or not people are right or wrong isn't necessarily of what's important to us as much as sort of how dealers are going to react to flows, right? Um, because if I right now buy a 700 strike call in Tesla, I'm forcing a dealer to hedge that call. The stock may never go to 700, uh, but I made that dealer buy his hedge today regardless, right? Now, how the stock moves is going to dictate, you know, the way that the dealer changes his hedge or adjusts his hedge. That's his gamma, you know, going forward. But as of this moment, the stock is going to go higher, you know, or should go higher because, I bought 700 strike calls and so did everybody else in, in Reddit or on Twitter or whatever. You know, we're all doing it at the same time. We're forcing the stock higher, at least immediately, um, based on our action. And I, I think that's kind of what the difference is, Kendall. You're, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great point. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of, the, there's a dynamic to this, but really we don't necessarily care where the options are trading initially. It's sort of what the hedging impact is and, and you know, um, how those flows are going to impact the underlying stock that, that we're kind of paying attention to. Hope, hopefully that helps to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, no, and uh, this is recorded everyone. So it, look for it later today, this afternoon, it's going to take a little while, um, but it will be up on our YouTube channel later this afternoon uh, under the uh, uh, pro trader webinar series. You'll see it there. Okay. Uh, Brent, thank you very much. Great. Appreciate the opportunity, Brent, uh, Bruce, and um, be talking to you soon. Okay. Sounds good. All, All right. right. Take it easy. Bye-bye.